exciting day we're having. Well, what I'd like to tell you about is one of my favorite recreations, which is snooping in the genetic databases. It's possible to snoop in the genetic databases because they're public access, and they're public access because they're tax supported. So anybody can do this, and so feel feel free to try it if you want to. Um, new genomes are being sequenced all the time. There are hundreds of new genomes, and um, they usually get sequenced at about the scaffold stage, which is when the fragments that have been uh, sequenced and put together into larger pieces are are put in are gradually put into very large pieces. And about that time, uh, the, ge the genome will get published, even though it isn't fully annotated. You know, all the genes haven't been identified. So annotation can take years. This is the genome data viewer. And this is, this is uh, just a small subset of species that have been annotated so far. And I just want to show you a couple of lizards. So here's two groups of lizards. There's this branch and this branch. And on one branch, we have the common lizard along with skinks and geckos. On the other branch, we have this green anole, plus also monitors, iguanids, and chameleons. And also snakes are on this branch. So this is what it looks like when the annotations are complete for a particular species. And you'll notice that these two different kinds of lizards have different kinds of chromosomes set up. So here you have kind of a, what looks like sort of a regular set of chromosomes. Um, and over here, with the anole, you've got a bunch of teeny tiny chromosomes. And this is typical of what you might see in a bird. Um, so it's, it's a different sort of, sort of chromosomal arrangement. And probably we're going to find that the, uh, the monitor has a similar set of chromosomes to what we're seeing here. So this is my Snoopy. This is Varanus komodoensis, or the Komodo dragon, or the Komodo monitor. And it's quite a big lizard, uh, it's usually over 10 feet long as an adult. If he was sticking his tongue out, you'd see it's forked like a snake's. The Komodo genome was first reported in 2019 by Lindenall, and it's still being annotated. The genome is about half the size of the human genome and contains about 1.5 gigabases or 1.5 billion bases of DNA. When a new genome gets sequenced, I like to look at the scaffolds for various genes just to see what they look like. As I mentioned, most of the databases are public so that you can do it too. It's really a lot of fun. It's kind of like finding your great-grandmother's love letters in the attic. So this is the gene that I was interested in looking for. It's the amylogenin gene, which encodes a protein involved in the mineralization of the tooth enamel. It's a gene that's in every vertebrate with teeth, and in some, like birds, that don't have teeth anymore. It's an interesting gene because it's very highly conserved, meaning that it doesn't change much between species, which makes it relatively easy to identify. It's also interesting because in humans, it's on the X chromosome, and it's also embedded inside another gene called ARH-GAP6, which has nothing to do with teeth at all. Most genes outside of bacteria are broken up into pieces called exons, which are separated by non-coding regions called introns. The amylogenin gene is in the first intron of ARH-GAP6 between ARH-GAP6 exons 1 and 2. 
So this is the location of the human gene. It's uh, on the X chromosome, as I said, and it's in a part of the X chromosome called the pseudo-autosomal region, which means that it's a little piece of the X chromosome which matches to a little piece of the Y chromosome. The X and the Y chromosomes have to be able to recognize each other during gamete formation so that they have little pieces that do match, even though most of the X chromosome is not represented at all on the Y. The human amylogenin gene has seven exons, but only the last five of them are used for coding the protein. This is the amino acid sequence of the protein. Each of these letters represents a different amino acid. And four of the amino acids are present in fairly high concentrations, proline, leucine, histidine, and glutamine, and especially proline and leucine. Proline is P, glutamine, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't mean leucine, glutamine is Q, um, and they are present in very high concentrations in this protein. So how do you find a gene if you don't know where it is? Well, the nice thing is that genes are older than species. I mentioned before that amylogenin is a common gene in the vertebrates. So it was invented, it was first uh, produced in the genome in the ancestor of the vertebrates. And once a gene gets invented, it tends to stay in all the, ascent, all the descendants of whoever it was that invented it. So to find a gene in a new, newly sequenced genome, you start with a gene that you know about, genomes of related organisms. Uh, one of my students, Tuan Nguyen, did a similar search for amylogen in the null genome, which was the first reptilian genome to be sequenced in 2011. And he started human sequence. But since we now know what the sequence looks like in another lizard, the anole. Now I can use that one to look for the amylogenin gene in Varanus. So the anole genome has uh, a few more bases in it than, uh, than the Varanus genome. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, they're similar to mammals in having X and Y chromosomes with the male as uh, having the X and the Y. But the amylogenin gene in the anole is not on the X chromosome, not on the anole X chromosome. It's on the anole um, chromosome 3. So that chromosome contains a lot of other markers found in the pseudoautosomal region of the human X. So the anole X and Y are therefore different chromosomes from the human X and the Y. So these are some of the databases that I used in looking for that amylogenin gene. And they're all public access, so any of you can, can look at these too. And uh, the NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, has a search tool called BLAST for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Um, and that's what I used to find uh, this gene. So this is just a summary of uh, how I found the gene in the Komodo scaffold. I used the anole messenger RNA as a query sequence to search in the amylogenin genome, or sorry, to search in the Komodo genome. And the database that I searched was the Varanus Komodoensis whole genome shotgun scaffolds. So the scaffolds, remember, are segments that are composed of overlapping sequence but not yet identified with specific chromosomes. So I found all of the anole exons, or at least exons 3 through 7, which have the coding sequence, in a single scaffold, SLA01. And each, and I was able to identify each of the Komodo exons by comparing them to the, um, the anole exons. And then I translated it to get the protein sequence. So this is the anole messenger RNA. 
it has seven exons. The exons are in alternating colors here, so that you can see where the breaks are. So there's a break between exon 1 and 2 right here. But the coding sequence doesn't start until the third exon. So this is the start codon, where the first amino acid is. Um, and then the last amino acid is in the seventh exon here. And this is the stop codon. So the stop codon is almost immediately after get into the seventh exon. So this just shows what the search looked like. This is a little piece of uh, scaffold SLA01. And this is the match with anol exon 6. Um, the scaffold is a pretty good sized one. It's just a little bit smaller than the human X chromosome. So it's got 138 million bases in it. And the um, exon identity is about 78%. So this just shows you how I was able to identify the boundaries of the other exons. Fortunately, introns all begin and end with the same two bases. Uh, GT at the beginning of an exon, which you can see at the end of this, or at the beginning of an intron, which you can see at the end of this exon 4. And then AG at the end of an intron, which you can see at the beginning of this exon 5. And then these two exons go together. So I located all the exons and then put them together to get the coding sequence for the amylogenin uh, protein. There were two possible start codons here and here. Uh, as you'll see later, it turns out that the second one um, is the real start codon. So then I translated the, uh, the sequence using the TransSeq software from EMBL. And this is the translation that I got for the amylogenin uh, messenger RNA. Uh, and as I mentioned, that this is probably the real start, this is the real beginning of the sequence. So this has, if we take these first three off, this has 191 amino acids with four amino acids. Um, the same four at very high frequency that we saw in the human protein. So then I compared this with several other amylogenin proteins in different species using DNA star laser gene megaline software. Um, and first I compared the sequences of anol, uh, the monitor sequence that I had translated, and the human. So I lined those up and compared them. Uh, and I also later compared an additional sequence from the horse. So this is what the alignment looks like in the anole human and Komodo amylogenins. Um, and as you can see, as you would expect, the Komodo and the anole sequences are much more closely related than the human sequence is to either of them. So these are the amylogenin sequences from monitor, anole, human, and horse. If you just sort of eyeball these, you can see that human and horse, for example, both have this PPHBGH sequence that starts right here, um, and that the anole and the monitor have a slightly different one, BGHBGY. So those two are similar. And these two are similar. And notice that they all end EEVD, glutamate glutamate valine aspartate. And this shows the comparison of those four species. So here's human and horse. Here's Komodo uh, and anol. Um, and it's interesting, I think, that the human and the horse are actually more closely related than the two lizards are. So the human uh, and horse sequences differ by about eight amino acids. Uh, the Komodo and the anole 
sequence differ by about uh, 15 amino acids or 15 percent of their amino acids and the lizard and the mammalian sequences differ by about 38 percent of their amino acids. So I did this adventure about uh, a year ago and in the meantime they've been working on the annotations of the um, of the Komodo sequence and so I thought well let's just look at it and see how it compares with well, with what I figured out here. So this is the amino acid sequence for Komodo, uh, for Varanus komodoensis in their annotation and it's much much bigger. The translation starts here and it ends down here so it's about three times the size of uh, the annotation that I figured out, but the one I figured out is right here in the middle. So this is basically the sequence that I figured out, except that this D is not in it. So in their annotation it goes from this V to this V, and I actually think they may have an incorrect annotation for exon 7. So the other question that I was interested in is, is the amylogenin also embedded in this ARH-GAP6 gene in the monitors? So I used the anol ARH-GAP6 gene mRNA as the query sequence to compare it with the uh, anol scaffold, um, and I found all 13 of the exons from the anol messenger RNA in the same scaffold where I found the amylogenin. Uh, and this is one of the larger exons, and this shows the comparison between them. So they're about 86% 80, identical um, to the anole. The, 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 the monitor is about 86% identical to the anole sequence. So this is just a list of uh, all of the exons that I found in that region. Um, and the important thing about it is that they're, they're in order. If you look at exon 9 and exon 8 and exon 10, they're lined up in the same uh, numerical sequence. Um, and then exon 1 uh, I found on the other side of amylogenin, which is right where it is, in humans, um, so that looked interesting. And then I compared that with the amylogenin uh, sequence from the annotated, or from the ARH gap sequence from the annotation, and there are a few differences. First off, I was not able to identify exons one and two um, in the in the in the um, monitor scaffold. And the reason for that is that sequences that don't get translated into protein aren't under any kind of um, any kind of restriction by selection. So they can change. They can change without killing the animal that they're in. And so they apparently have changed enough that I could not identify them. But uh, they are annotated here, and they are, uh, these this exons 1 or 2 are in reasonable locations for um, the rest of the exons. The other difference is in uh, the annotated sequences, exons 1, 2, and 3. Um, their exon 1 is not where my exon 1 is. And they also have uh, two additional exons, which don't match with mine, exons 2. And they also have an additional exon. So their exon 4 matches to my exon 3. And then all the other exons between exon 3 and exon 13 match in both sequences. So I translated both of those. I translated their protein and my protein. 
So my protein uh, has exon 1 product here, exon 2 product here, and then starts exon 3 with these four amino acids, D, G, Q, K. And the annotated sequence has three exons, a teeny, teeny tiny exon 1, um, and their exon 2, and then they have a third exon before we get to uh, the place where, where it matches all the way down. So this is uh, their fourth exon and my third starts with those same four amino acids. So I took those two and I matched them with, uh, with other lizard proteins. So these are the matches that I got with my ARH-GAP6 sequence. Um, and with the anole, which you can see sticking his forked tongue out here, uh, it doesn't match until my uh, until the, the anole until the sorry until the monitor um, residue number forty seven, which is that DGQK. But I did find matches to exons one and two other lizards, uh, or these are the two that I, that I picked up. So exon 1 is here, exon 2 starts about here, um, and then their exon 2 ends about here and goes into uh, the next, uh, it goes into, let's see, where is it? Well, it's in here somewhere. Uh, goes into the third exon. And the same thing is true in this lizard. So this is um, the viviparous lizard, Zoatica vivipara, and this is the green anole. So I did find matches with exons 1 and 2 in two other lizards. If I tried that with the, the Baroness annotation, uh, I did not find any matches to any lizards until this part where they go to get, where they come together. Uh, so they they start at the D G Q K. So I have a lot of faith um, in the the uh, annotation that I put together. Uh, and one thing I need to say here is that when these when these annotations are first uh, put together, they're they're put together with a computer algorithm that is probably, I may be the first human to actually have looked at this annotation. So it probably wasn't done by a human. It was probably done by an algorithm. Um, that is probably what accounts for the differences between them. Um, but nevertheless, I'm going to write to NCBI um, and offer them uh, my version of it and see what they say. So this is just some references that you might find useful if you want to try this yourself with any gene that you like. As I said, the, um, the databases are all perfectly open so that you can do this, and it's a lot of fun. So are there any questions? I'm sure there are, because I have not been keeping up with the chat. Now, what they, uh, I see Stephen had a question about did they start with an mRNA? And they start by looking for uh, what's called open reading frames. That is bits of the DNA that can be translated continuously. So they look for large open reading frames. And then they look for the, uh, they look for the signatures of the introns. So that's how they identify the exons. So that's, that's what the algorithm looks for. So they probably didn't start, as I did, with the message RNA from something else. Well, I just do it for fun, because I like looking at, uh, at, at new, um, new sequences, newly synthesized sequences. Um, and it can it can be difficult to identify small exons. 
In fact, the exon 1 in ARH GAP6 um, is, is actually not as uh, highly conserved as the other exons. Uh, yes, it probably is valuable to look at the 3D, but those are not so easy to predict. They're still working on algorithms to try to figure out how to do that. Well, I'll just write them a note and suggest uh, the alternative. I did it once before. Once upon a time, I was I gave my students a uh, a project with uh, cat beta globins, and so I was looking at the cat beta globins, and I looked at the lion globin, and it didn't look right. It looked more like uh, it looked more like a um, it looked it looked more like a a primate globin than it did like a cat globin. So I wrote him a note and I said, you know, I think maybe you got the wrong sequence for the beta globin in the lion, so would you check on it? Uh, so they did. They checked with the people that, uh, that turned it in and they found out that they, they had, it was just a mistake in the database. So there are probably other errors in the databases that, that people will pick up. It is a lot of fun. It really is uh, because there's there's always several new sequences that are that are popping up in the literature every year, and you can play with them. Another another gene that I like. Uh, oh, it's a great it's a great undergraduate project, Stephen. Yes, I, I always have them do something like this. Uh, but an, another uh, I had another student who was looking at the, um, the the color vision receptors in lizards, uh, and they're quite different from species to species. I mean, they're they're all they're all identifiable. But they're not uh, they're not all the same the 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 way that the color vision receptors are divvied up are not quite the same in all species yes Baragon, that's uh that's that's the general rule with the the water on the outside water loving on the outside and the water hating on the inside but there are uh, a, a lot of a lot of other things um, that contribute to that. So protein folding really is quite complicated. Yeah, the disulfide bonds from cysteines are are good clues too. Origami is exactly the way I think about it, um, Syzygy. In fact, I sometimes tell the students that this is like this is like origami. And what we're trying to find out is what are what are the folding rules? I don't think I've ever seen a protein that looked like a swan, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was one. <laughs> That's great, Nero. I'm just going to go back through the chat and see if I've missed any. Well, I know I missed some questions. But.
I do. I do sometimes look uh, for words in, um, for you know, English words in the amino acid sequences. I looked for some words in Titan, and uh, I couldn't find my own name, but I did find Elvis.